Regina is a brilliant computer scientist whose research has been acknowledged with the MacArthur Fellowship. Regina's research has spanned a wide range of topics, from explainable machine learning to deciphering human languages. But since surviving breast cancer in 2014, Regina has increasingly focused her efforts on healthcare. And the algorithms that she's developed for breast cancer treatment and diagnosis have been tested at multiple hospitals around the globe, including here in Sweden. And through this work, Regina realized that had her doctors had access to a machine learning model like hers, they could have detected her cancer as much as three years earlier. For the transformative impact of her work, Regina was awarded the Advancement, uh, Advancement of Artificial Intelligence Squirrel Award, a $1 million prize only rivaled by the Nobel and Turing Awards in their level of associated funding. So we're honored that she was able to fly over from Boston and join us here in person today. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Regina Barzilay. Hello, I'm actually very delighted that I'm here. It's my first time in Stockholm, so it's great. Thank you very much for bringing me here. It looks lovely, at least warmer than Boston. And uh, the topic I'm going to be discussing today is actually not breast cancer. I do work on the whole range of things. I work like Daphne in the area of drug discovery. I particularly work on machine learning for modeling proteins, small molecules, their interaction, generating new molecules. And I have some research on clinical AI. But the topic that I'm going to talk to you about um, is uh, detecting early lung cancer. And just, you know, when I was preparing for this conference, I had to send my slides a week before the conference so they can put it in this beautiful format. But during last week, I just asked organizers to add this slide because uh, in the US, all over the news, there was this discovery that people in, uh, you know, doctors knew about it, but it was kind of revealed to the general public that today uh, in women, the majority of women who are diagnosed with lung cancer never smoked. And they demonstrated that specifically, for instance, for Asian American women, 80% of diagnoses are women who never smoked. So, Whatever we know about lung cancer and we associate it very heavily with smoke, it gives us all this kind of confidence that we're doing great because we never smoke, nobody in our household smoke. We also don't understand some people did smoke their whole life and never got lung cancer. So um, I actually started working on this topic when a friend of mine who never smoked, who was a runner uh, at age 50, uh, started coughing and she was coughing for some time and then eventually, uh, half a year later, she was diagnosed with lung cancer and, uh, you know, and she passed away. But uh, as a result of the, this uh, connection, I actually met a doctor at MGH. This is uh, the lady which stands near me on this picture, Dr. Alicia Sequest. And we decided to look into ways to predict whether the patient is likely to develop lung cancer. If you're looking at the numbers of what are our biggest killers in terms of cancers, lung cancer is the top killing cancer both in men and in women. And the reason is because we typically discover it at a point that there is no effective treatment. We do know how to treat diseases very early, but when they're advanced, same lung, same pancreatic cancer, we cannot really treat them. So the question we asked ourselves, can you look at the image, let's say CT scan, of a patient who is not currently considered to be having lung cancer and predict what's going to happen to them in up to six years? And uh, what happens today, again, I'm giving the numbers in the United States, but they're not, no better in Europe. What happens today, that there are screening programs, but because you know, people, even if they look at your CT, it's very hard for them to say who is likely to be high risk. They look at this nodule and they're not sure. So what happens that if you're looking today of whoever got now lung cancer, 50% are not supposed to be doing screening. We're clearly not kind of screening the right subset of the population. So we really have to look at some algorithmic way to say who is high risk. And... Um, the way you can do it, you can take uh, lung CTs of people 
where you do know the outcomes. And then in the US, there was this very big trial, which is called National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, where a very large group of people from 30-something hospitals were diagnosed, were monitored over time. So you have the original uh, CT scan, and then you see what happened to them within six years. And then, you know, you don't need to tell the machine what it should be paying attention to. You just have an image, and you have six-year outcome, and you try to predict, uh, you know, what's going to happen. Now, what the machine does in this case, it predicts your risk for up to six years. We don't require any annotation. We don't ask, can you highlight the nodule? Can you highlight something white or something whatever? We don't ask people any questions. And here, this is actually very interesting. I was listening to Daphne's talk. Um, about noise in the data. One of the things that we discovered, and we, I discovered it, not discovered, we just observed, across many areas of healthcare, that whenever you ask a patient a question, you think that what they are telling you is a truth, but what we've seen that it is not oftentimes, for various reasons. Women who do, do, do to do mammogram, you give them a questionnaire, they're in a hurry, they're just gonna mark something, and then we are treating it as God's truth. And uh, we just decided we're not gonna be asking any question about the patient. We just have the CT scan, and we are predicting the outcomes. And um, in this case, um, Again, uh, coming back to Daphne's talk, and this is one of the questions for many computer scientists. Am I just applying existing methods or do I need to do something special? So in this case, there are lots of reasons why do you need to do something special. I'll just give you one example. CT scans have different um, sl uh, slice uh, size and you need to be able to adapt to it. You want to be able, again, to help machine to look at the right part of the image. So you need to have some model that will project if the cancer is discovered, project it back. So there is a lot of changes that you need to do and also CT scans are really, really large. So there is a lot of computer science that needs to get into it to ensure that you actually are, you know, doing the right thing here. And um, I want to show you this example. It's actually a man who was on trial, and this is at the time when he was screened. He was sent home, and they said that he's benign. If it will be a normal case, not the case of clinical trial, most likely he would never come back to the doctor. Now, when we run the, uh, the model, it's called Sibyl as prophetess. Um, if you look at the attention, it focused on this particular spot, which is shown here in like light red. Three years later, in exactly this spot, there was a cancer. But the problem is that the first time when the model predicted that this patient is actually um, likely to be high risk, no radiologist can see any signs of upcoming cancer. So it really shows to you that human capacity to make this type of predictions is very, very limited. Uh, and uh, the next thing that I wanted to show you, sorry, uh, actually how well this model works. And it works surprisingly well. By the way, for people who are making pictures, continue taking pictures if you want to, but all the results that I'm reporting, they are published. Uh, in, uh, you can just do a search on my name and Sibel. It is a journal of clinical oncology article, so you would see all the tables and many more. But you can see this is actually surprisingly high accuracy. Up to two years, you can have AUC above 80 identifying those high-risk people because it even does well when we are looking five, uh, six years ahead. It's 76, but you know the point in which you need to decide what to do is you're really looking at the horizon, what happens now. And uh, the model works quite well. Um, the next things that I currently illustrating to you again, the cases where human look at the image, the radiologist, the trained radiologist that participated in the trial, they didn't see anything. Uh, they gave to the model, uh, they gave the image benign status, and the model predicted for these images that the patient is going to develop lung cancer, and indeed they did develop the lung cancer. Um, Another interesting uh, topic that we are currently looking at um, is how can you decide when somebody needs to be screened? For those of you in the audience, maybe there, is a, there, are, yeah, there are some women in the audience, um, 
the you know like there is a whole industry of scientists whose uh, you know whose whole area of research is to decide what is the right screening like for mammograms should you be screened every year like in the US do should you do every two years like many European countries do should you do it every three years and there is like endless endless questions how often should be screened because it's expensive and whenever you screen somebody and you maybe see something you need to do medical intervention so here we published a paper in um, uh, Nature Medicine, which shows how you can apply reinforcement learning to predict an optimal screening regime for every patient. And uh, we hope that as uh, you know, medicine continues, instead of giving to everybody the same frequency, we would be able to actually learn and optimize this policy for individual patients. Uh, and there are uh, several points that I wanted to make. First of all, we are not looking at all uh, at, you know, at different uh, nodules or anything else. The machine just takes the whole image. And you remember earlier I told you that we don't ask people any questions about like how much did they smoke. You can say this doesn't make any sense because, you know, smoke in the number of packs is really an important predictor. So it turns out that if you take in the image, you can predict a lot of information from the image alone. We actually can predict here, you can see the numbers, we can predict how much the person smokes, ju smoke just looking at the image. So there is no point to ask these questions because you see the imprint in the tissue. Similarly, when you process mammograms, you can predict whether women breast fat, whether they have children and other things. It all has its own imprint on the tissue, no point to ask patients about it. Um, so what I was kind of suggesting to you, and this is very liberating, you can say, you know what, forget about what doctors were always doing. They have these biomarkers, they annotate nodules, they have the, their own heuristics. We're just telling, just give me an image, give me an outcome and learn it. So the problem with this approach is that now you're kind of giving to your machine learning algorithm full freedom, correct? And the question that comes here is how are we sure that this model generalizes? How can we ensure that they are actually interpretable or not interpretable? And remember that when the radiologist uses this Sybil algorithm, they cannot validate. They look at the image, they cannot predict whether this patient is going to develop lung cancer or not. So it has to trust the machine, which is hard, correct? Uh, and this is like a real problem because of what we know and we've seen a lot of papers in the last two years that shows that if you train, you know, your model on one population and you apply it to another population, many times due to the distribution shift, performance actually significantly goes down. This is a problem, correct? Because uh, we want to have something that works and we don't need to retrain it on every subpopulation. And what we've done here in that paper that I was referencing, we actually went to several different populations which were not used at all in the trial and uh, tested the model. And one of them that I want to highlight here, it's actually Taiwanese patients. And uh, the reason they're interesting, because in the US, all the patients who are screened, they're all heavy smokers. Others just cannot get the screening. In Taiwan, any person can get screening. So our cohort in which we tested had both smokers and non-smokers. And you can see in this case, the performance actually stayed the same, which is kind of nice. And I want to say that, you know, you really need, when we're talking about um, a computer science, we really have to work hard here to ensure that the models generalize because there are many different dimensions across which it can be different. It can be different because of demographics, age, gender, so on. It can be different just because your hospital takes images differently or machine set up differently. And I just want to show you that in this case, I'm showing in the case of mammogram, but um, what you can see is that if you take machines, which are the same manufacturer, just slightly different calibrations of the machine, internally, when the image is encoded, they actually two separate clouds. And you need, and that's what we did in the algorithm, we actually need to do this invariant learning and to teach the machine to abstract it into a vectors which are not so specific, so you can generalize better. Um, and uh, this is the question which is um, kind of interesting. The person who introduced me, she was telling that my speciality is interpretable machine learning. I did write papers on interpretable machine learning. But um, through the years, I've become a very big skeptic. And the reason that I'm skeptic of interpretable machine learning is the following. 
today we're increasingly applying this algorithm to solve the task that we as a human cannot solve. Like no human can look at the image which doesn't have any sign of growth of cancer and say this patient is going to have lung cancer or breast cancer or whatever. So how exactly can you make human, what interpretation will convince you, correct? Like if we can solve the task, like if I would ask you, where is calcification on this image? You can say a machine showed me this and I agree and we are all good. But if I'm asking you to predict something that as a human I cannot do it, there is no way for us uh, truly validate it. And uh, there was actually a work done by my colleague at MIT, Professor Marzia Gassemi, that demonstrated that whenever you give this half-cooked explanation, which will be, let's say, attention maps and others, doctors, their performance actually goes down because this kind of tea leaf reading gives them uh, false confidence that the machine is doing the right thing and they turn off any capacity kind of to critically look at the evidence. Um, and the question is, what do you do? So now we cannot really request machine to give us interpretation because human cannot do it. So what do you do? So we did a lot of work at, in my group at MIT on looking at the calibration because what you know, every machine learning model, like deep learning model, always gives you uh, confidence of prediction, correct? So you have a confidence. But the problem is that whenever you are moving out of kind of your domain of application, this confidence can be, you can be either overconfident or underconfident. In other words, the model is not calibrated, what we know in statistical terms. Uh, so what I am hoping to achieve here is to have the capacity of the model to say, you know, this is a data, this is particular instances where I am not calibrated and you are alerting the human and let the human decide what do they do. The same way as, you know, when you're driving your car, you don't need to be mechanic, you don't need to understand why it doesn't work. There is a red light that tells you something is wrong, somebody needs to look into it. So we are doing a lot of work on designing models that kind of abstain uh, and can recognize situation in which they are not uh, calibrated. And uh, now, this model Sybil is uh, in different levels of implementation. It can be retrospectively validated in many countries. And there are several big hospitals like uh, VA, Veteran Affairs in the US and in some European countries are now you know, starting to learn how to bring Sybil for the national screening. But I want to complete my talk with this particular imagery, which I think um, really, um, puts the innovation in context. Um, today, there are lots of studies that demonstrate that AI really didn't penetrate healthcare. There are lots of papers about what you can do. Sybil is one example. But if you look how the patients are treated and you can think about your own examples, you know, AI is still not there. And I just want <laughs> to uh, remind you the case of electricity. Uh, you know, the first bulb was produced in 1870, uh, shortly after we had uh, the first uh, power station. However, 30 years later, 95% of the factories were still using steam engines. And the reason the first generation of electricity-based um, factories fail is because they try to use it the same way as they configured steam engines. So I hope we don't need 30 years to bring all this big advancement and to change healthcare outcomes. So thank you very much.